Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad. Chapters eighteen and nineteen. Chapter eighteen. Six months afterwards, my friend, he was a cynical, more than middle aged bachelor, with a reputation for eccentricity, and owned a rice mill, wrote to me, and judging from the warmth of my recommendation that I would like to hear, enlarged a little upon Jim's perfections. These were apparently of a quiet and effective sort. Not having been able so far to find more in my heart than a resigned toleration for any individual of my kind, I have lived till now alone in a house that even in this steaming climate could be considered as too big for one man. I have had him to live with me for some time past. It seems I haven't made a mistake. It seemed to me upon reading this letter that my friend had found in his heart more than tolerance for Jim, that there were the beginnings of active liking. Of course he stated his grounds in a characteristic way. For one thing, Jim kept his freshness in the climate. Had he been a girl, my friend wrote, one could have said he was blooming. Blooming modestly, like a violet, not like some of these blatant tropical flowers. He had been in the house for six weeks, and had not as yet attempted to slap him on the back, or address him as old boy, or try to make him feel a superannuated fossil. He had nothing of the exasperating young man's chatter. He was good-tempered, had not much to say for himself, was not clever by any means, thank goodness, wrote my friend. It appeared, however, that Jim was clever enough to be quietly appreciative of his wit, while, on the other hand, he amused him by his naiveness. The dew is yet on him, and since I had the bright idea of giving him a room in the house, and having him at meals, I feel less withered myself. The other day he took it into his head to cross the room with no other purpose but to open a door for me, and I felt much more in touch with mankind than I had been for years. Ridiculous, isn't it? Of course, I guess there is something, some awful little scrape, which you know about. But if I am sure that it is terribly heinous, I fancy one could manage to forgive it. For my part, I declare I am unable to imagine him guilty of anything much worse than robbing an orchard. Is it much worse? Perhaps you ought to have told me. But it is such a long time since we both turned saints that you may have forgotten we, too, have sinned in our time. It may be that some day I shall have to ask you, and then I shall expect to be told. I don't care to question him myself till I have some idea what it is. Moreover, it's too soon as yet. Let him open the door a few times more for me. Thus, my friend, I was trebly pleased, at Jim's shaping so well, at the tone of the letter, at my own cleverness. Evidently I had known what I was doing. I had read characters aright, and so on. And what if something unexpected and wonderful were to come of it? That evening, reposing in a deck-chair under the shade of my own poop awning, it was in Hong Kong Harbour, I laid on Jim's behalf the first stone of a castle in Spain. I made a trip to the northward, and when I returned I found another letter from my friend waiting for me. It was the first envelope I tore open. "'There are no spoons missing, as far as I know,' ran the first line. "'I haven't been interested enough to inquire. "'He is gone, leaving on the breakfast-table a formal little note of apology, "'which is either silly or heartless. "'Probably both, and it's all one to me. "'Allow me to say, lest you should have some more mysterious young men in reserve, "'that I have shut up shop, definitely and forever. "'This is the last eccentricity I shall be guilty of.' Do not imagine for a moment that I care a hang, but he is very much regretted at tennis parties, and for my own sake I have told a plausible lie at the club. I flung the letter aside and started looking through the batch at my table, till I came upon Jim's handwriting. Would you believe it? One chance in a hundred. But it is always that hundredth chance. That little second engineer of the Patna had turned up in a more or less destitute state, and got a temporary job of looking after the machinery of the mill. I couldn't stand the familiarity of the little beast. 
jim wrote from a seaport seven hundred miles south of the place where he should have been in clover i am now for the time with egstrom and blake uh, ship chandlers as their well runner to call the thing by its right name for reference i gave them your name which they know of course and if you could write a word in my favour it would be permanent employment i was utterly crushed under the ruins of my castle but of course i wrote as desired before the end of the year my new charter took me that way and i had an opportunity of seeing him he was still with egstrom and blake and we met in what they called our parlour opening out of the store he had that moment come in from boarding a ship and confronted me head down ready for a tussle what have you got to say for yourself i began as soon as we had shaken hands what i wrote you nothing more he said stubbornly did the fellow blab or what i asked he looked up at me with a troubled smile oh no he didn't he made it a kind of confidential business between us he was most damnably mysterious whenever i came over to the mill he would wink at me in a respectful manner as much as to say we know what we know infernally fawning and familiar and that sort of thing he threw himself into a chair and stared down his legs one day we happened to be alone and the fellow had the cheek to say well mr james i was called mr james there as if i'd been the son here we are together once more this is better than the old ship ain't it wasn't it appalling eh i looked at him and he put on a knowing air don't you be uneasy sir he says i know a gentleman when i see one and i know how a gentleman feels i know though you will be keeping me on this job i had a hard time of it too along of that rotten old patna racket jove it was awful i don't know what i should have said or done if i had not just then heard mr denver calling me in the passage it was tiffin time and we walked together across the yard and through the garden to the bungalow he began to chaff me in his kindly way i believe he liked me jim was silent for a while i know he liked me that's what made it so hard such a splendid man that morning he slipped his hand under my arm he too was familiar with me he burst into a short laugh and dropped his chin on his breast <laughs> when i remembered how that mean little beast had been talking to me he began suddenly in a vibrating voice i couldn't bear to think of myself i suppose you know i nodded more like a father he cried his voice sank i would have had to tell him i couldn't let it go on could i well i murmured after waiting a while i preferred to go he said slowly this thing must be buried we could hear in the shop blake upbraiding egstrom in an abusive strained voice they had been associated for many years and every day from the moment the doors were opened to the last minute before closing blake a little man with sleek jetty hair and unhappy beady eyes could be heard rowing his partner incessantly with a sort of scathing and plaintive fury the sound of that everlasting scolding was part of the place like the other fixtures even strangers would very soon come to disregard it completely unless it be perhaps to mutter nuisance or to get up suddenly and shut the door of the parlour egstrom himself a raw-boned heavy scandinavian with a busy manner and immense blond whiskers went on directing his people checking parcels making out bills or writing letters at a stand-up desk in the shop and comported himself in that clatter exactly as though he had been stone deaf now and again he would emit a bothered perfunctory shh which neither produced nor was expected to produce the slightest effect they are very decent to me here said jim blake's a little cad but egstrom's all right he stood up quickly and walking with measured steps to a tripod telescope standing in the window and pointed at the roadstead he applied his eye to it. "'There's that ship, which has been becalmed outside all the morning, has got a breeze now and is coming in,' he remarked patiently. 
I must go and board. We shook hands in silence, and he turned to go. Jim! I cried. He looked round with his hand on the lock. You... you have thrown away something like a fortune. He came back to me all the way from the door. Such a splendid old chap, he said. How could I? How could I? His lips twitched. Here it does not matter. Oh, you... you... I began, and had to cast about for a suitable word, but before I became aware that there was no name that would just do, he was gone. I heard outside Eggstrom's deep, gentle voice saying cheerily, "'That's the Sarah W. Granger, Jimmy. You must manage to be first aboard.' And directly Blake struck in, screaming after the manner of an outraged cockatoo, "'Tell the captain we've got some of his mail here.' "'That'll fetch him. Do you hear, Mr. What's-your-name?' And there was Jim answering Eggstrom with something boyish in his tone. "'All right. I'll make a race of it.' He seemed to take refuge in the boat-sailing part of that sorry business. I did not see him again that trip, but on my next—I had a six-month's charter—I went up to the store. Ten yards away from the door, Blake's scolding met my ears, and when I came up he gave me a glance of utter wretchedness. Eggstrom, all smiles, advanced, extending a large, bony hand. "'Glad to see you, Captain. Shh! I've been thinking you were about due back here. What did you say, sir?' "'Shh! Oh, him. He has left us. Come into the parlour.' After the slam of the door, Blake's strained voice became faint, as the voice of one scolding desperately in a wilderness. "'Put us to great inconvenience, too. Used us badly, I must say.' "'Where's he gone to? Do you know?' I asked. "'No. It's no use asking, either,' said Eggstrom, standing bewhiskered and obliging before me, with his arms hanging down his sides clumsily, and a thin silver watch-chain looped very low on a rucked-up blue serge waistcoat. "'Man like that don't go anywhere in particular.' I was too concerned at the news to ask for the explanation of that pronouncement, and he went on. He left, let's see, uh, the very day a steamer with returning pilgrims from the Red Sea put in here with two blades of a propeller gone. Three weeks ago now. Wasn't there something said about the Patna case? I asked, fearing the worst. He gave a start, and looked at me as if I'd been a sorcerer. Why, yes, how do you know? Some of them were talking about it here. There was a captain or two, the manager of uh, Van Lowe's engineering shop at the harbor, two or three others, and myself. Jim was in here, too, having a sandwich and a glass of beer. When we are busy, you see, Captain, there's no time for a proper tiffin. He was standing by this table eating sandwiches, and the rest of us were round the telescope watching that steamer come in. And by and by Van Lowe's manager began uh, to talk about the chief of the Patna. He had done some repairs for him once, and from that he went on to tell us uh, what an old ruin she was, and the money that had been made out of her. He came to mention her last voyage, and then we all struck in. Some said one thing, and some said another, not much. But what you or any other man might say, and there was some laughing. Captain O'Brien of the Sarah W. Granger, a large, noisy old man with a stick, he was sitting listening to us in this armchair here. He let drive suddenly with his stick at the floor and roars out, Skunks! Made us all jump. Vanlo's manager winks at us and asks, What's the matter, Captain O'Brien? Matter? Matter? the old man began to shout. What are you injuns laughing at? It's no laughing matter. It's a disgrace to human nature, that's what it is. I would despise being seen in the same room with one of those men. Yes, sir. He seemed to catch me eye like, and I had to speak out of civility. Skunks, says I. Of course, Captain O'Brien, and I wouldn't care to have them here myself. So you're quite safe in this room, Captain O'Brien. Have a little something cool to drink. Damn your drink, Eggstrom, says he, with a twinkle in his eye. When I want a drink, I will shout for it. I'm going to quit. It stinks here now. At this all the others burst out laughing, and out they go after the old man. 
and then sir that blasted jim he puts down the sandwich he had in his hands and walks round a table to me there was a glass of beer poured out quite full i am off he says just like this it isn't half past one yet i says i you might snatch a smoke first i thought he meant it was time for him to go down to his work when i understood what he was up to my arms fell so can't get a man like that every day you know sir a regular devil for sailing a boat ready to go out miles to sea to meet ships in any sort of weather more than once the captain would come here full of it and the first thing he would say would be that's a reckless sort of lunatic you got for a water clerk egstrom i was feeling my way at daylight under short canvas when there comes flying out of the mist right under my forefoot a boat half under water sprays going over the masthead two frightened niggers on the bottom boards a yelling fiend at the tiller hey hey ship ahoy captain hey hey egstrom and blake's man first to speak to you hey hey egstrom and blake hallo hey whoop kick the niggers out reef a squall on at the time shoots ahead whooping and yelling to me to make sail and he would give me a lead in more like a demon than a man never saw a boat handled like that in all my life couldn't have been drunk was he such a quiet soft-spoken chap too blushed like a girl when he came on board i tell you captain marlow nobody had a chance against us with a strange ship when jim was out the other ship chandlers just kept their old customers and egstrom appeared overcome with emotion why sir it seemed as though he wouldn't mind going a hundred miles out to sea in an old shoe to nab a ship for the firm if the business had been his own and all to make yet he couldn't have done more in that way and now all at once like this thinks i to myself a hole a rise in the screw that's the trouble is it all right says i no need of all that fuss with me jimmy just mention your figure anything in reason he looks at me as if he wanted to swallow something that stuck in his throat i can't stop with you what's that bloomin joke i asks he shakes his head and i could see in his eye he was as good as gone already sir so i turned to him and slanged him till all was blue what is it you're running away from i asks who has been getting at you what scared you you haven't as much sense as a rat they don't clear out from a good ship where do you expect to get a better berth you this and you that i made him look sick i can tell you this business ain't going to sink says i he gave a big jump good-bye he says nodding at me like a lord you ain't half a bad chap egstrom i give you my word that if you knew my reasons you wouldn't care to keep me that's the biggest lie you ever told in your life says i i know my mind he made me so mad that i had to laugh can't you really stop long enough to drink this glass of beer here you funny beggar you i don't know what came over him he didn't seem able to find the door something comical i can tell you captain i drank the beer myself well if you're in such a hurry here's luck to you and your own drink says i only you mark my words if you keep up this game you'll very soon find that the earth ain't big enough to hold you that's all he gave me one black look and out he rushed with a face fit to scare little children egstrom snorted bitterly and combed one auburn whisker with knotty fingers haven't been able to get a man that was any good since it's nothing but worry 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 in business and where might you have come across him captain if it's fair to ask he was the mate of the patna that voyage i said feeling that i owed some explanation for a time egstrom remained very still with his fingers plunged in the hair at the side of his face and then exploded and who the devil cares about that i dare say no one i began and what the devil is he anyhow for to go on like this he stuffed suddenly his left whisker into his mouth and stood amazed <laughs> gee he exclaimed i told him the earth wouldn't be big enough to hold his caper chapter nineteen i have told you these two episodes at length to show his manner of dealing with himself under the new conditions of his life there were many others of the sort more than i could count on the fingers of my two hands 
They were all equally tinged by a high-minded absurdity of intention that made their futility profound and touching. To fling away your daily bread so as to get your hands free for a grapple with a ghost may be an act of prosaic heroism. Men had done it before, though we who have lived know full well that it is not the haunted soul but the hungry body that makes an outcast. And men who had eaten and meant to eat every day applauded the creditable folly. He was indeed unfortunate, for all his recklessness could not carry him out from under the shadow. There was always a doubt of his courage. The truth seems to be that it is impossible to lay the ghost of a fact. You can face it or shirk it. And I have come across a man or two who could wink at their familiar shades. Obviously Jim was not of the winking sort. But what I could never make up my mind about was whether his line of conduct amounted to shirking his ghost or facing him out. I strained my mental eyesight only to discover that, as with the complexion of all our actions, the shade of difference was so delicate that it was impossible to say. It might have been flight, and it might have been a mode of combat. To the common mind he became known as a rolling stone, because this was the funniest part. He did, after a time, become perfectly known, and even notorious within the circle of his wanderings which had a diameter of, say, three thousand miles, in the same way as an eccentric character is known to the whole countryside. For instance, in Bangkok, where he found his employment with Yucker brothers, charterers, and teak merchants, it was almost pathetic to see him go about in sunshine hugging his secret, which was known to the very up-country logs on the river. Schomburg, the keeper of the hotel where he boarded, a hirsute Alsatian of manly bearing, and an irrepressible retailer of all the scandalous gossip of the place, would, with both elbows on the table, impart an adorned version of the story to any guest who cared to imbibe knowledge along with the more costly liquors. And, mind you, the nicest fellow you could meet would be his generous conclusion. Quite superior. It says a lot for the casual crowd that frequented Schomburg's establishment that Jim managed to hang out in Bangkok for a whole six months. I remarked that people, perfect strangers, took to him as one takes to a nice child. His manner was reserved, but it was as though his personal appearance, his hair, his eyes, his smile, made friends for him wherever he went. And, of course, he was no fool." I heard Siegmund Jucker, native of Switzerland, a gentle creature ravaged by a cruel dyspepsia, and so frightfully lame that his head swung through a quarter of a circle at every step he took, declare appreciatively that for one so young he was of great capacity, as though it had been a mere question of cubic contents. Why not send him up country? I suggested anxiously. Yucca Brothers had concessions and teak forests in the interior. If he has capacity, as you say, he will soon get hold of the work, and physically is very fit. His health is always excellent. Ah! It is a great thing in this country to be free from dyspepsia, sighed poor Yucker enviously, casting a stealthy glance at the pit of his ruined stomach. I left him drumming pensively on his desk and muttering, Es ist ein Idee. Es ist ein Idee. Unfortunately, that very evening an unpleasant affair took place in the hotel. I don't know that I blame Jim very much, but it was a truly regrettable incident. It belonged to the lamentable species of barroom scuffles, and the other party to it was a cross-eyed Dane of sorts, whose visiting card recited under his misbegotten name, first lieutenant in the Royal Siamese Navy. The fellow, of course, was utterly hopeless at billiards, but did not like to be beaten, I suppose. He had had enough to drink to turn nasty after the sixth game, and make some scornful remark at Jim's expense. Most of the people there didn't hear what was said, and those who had heard seemed to have had all precise recollections scared out of them by the appalling nature of the consequences that immediately ensued. It was very lucky for the Dane that he could swim, because the room opened on a veranda and the menam flowed below very wide and black. 
a boatload of chinamen bound as likely as not on some thieving expedition fished out the officer of the king of siam and jim turned up at about midnight on board my ship without a hat everybody in the room seemed to know he said gasping yet from the contest as it were he was rather sorry on general principles for what had happened though in this case there had been he said no option but what dismayed him was to find the nature of his burden as well known to everybody as though he had gone about all that time carrying it on his shoulders naturally after this he couldn't remain in the place he was universally condemned for the brutal violence so unbecoming a man in his delicate position some maintained he had been disgracefully drunk at the time others criticized his want of tact even schomberg was very much annoyed he is a very nice young man he said argumentatively to me but the lieutenant is a first-rate fellow too he dines every night at my table d'hote you know and there's a billiard cue broken i can't allow that uh, first thing this morning i went over with my apologies to the lieutenant and i think that i've made that all right for myself uh, but only think captain if everybody started such games why the man might have been drowned and here i can't run out into the next street and buy a new queue i've got to write to europe for them no no a temper like that won't do he was extremely sore on the subject this was the worst incident of all in his uh, his retreat nobody could deplore it more than myself for if as somebody said hearing him mentioned oh yes i know he has knocked about a good deal out here yet he had somehow avoided being battered and chipped in the process this last affair however made me seriously uneasy because if his exquisite sensibilities were to go the length of involving him in pothouse shindies he would lose his name of an inoffensive if aggravating fool and acquire that of a common loafer for all my confidence in him i could not help reflecting that in such cases from the name to the thing itself is but a step i suppose you will understand by that time i could not think of washing my hands of him i took him away from bangkok in my ship and we had a longish passage it was pitiful to see how he shrank within himself a seaman even if a mere passenger takes an interest in a ship and looks at the sea life around him with the critical enjoyment of a painter for instance looking at another man's work in every sense of the expression he is on deck but my jim for the most part sulked down below as though he had been a stowaway he infected me so that i avoided speaking on professional matters such as would suggest themselves naturally to two sailors during a passage for whole days we did not exchange a word i felt extremely unwilling to give orders to my officers in his presence often when alone with him on deck or in the cabin we didn't know what to do with our eyes i placed him with de jong as you know glad enough to dispose of him in any way yet persuaded that his position was now growing intolerable he had lost some of that elasticity which had enabled him to rebound back into his uncompromising position after every overthrow one day coming ashore i saw him standing on the quay the water of the roadstead and the sea in the offing made one smooth ascending plain and the outermost ships at anchor seemed to ride motionless in the sky he was waiting for his boat which was being loaded at our feet with packages of small stores for some vessel ready to leave after exchanging greetings we remained silent side by side jove he said suddenly this is killing work he smiled at me i must say he generally could manage a smile i made no reply i knew very well he was not alluding to his duties he had an easy time of it with de jong nevertheless as soon as he had spoken i became completely convinced that the work was killing i did not even look at him would you like said i to leave this part of the world altogether try california or the west coast i'll see what i can do he interrupted me a little scornfully what difference would it make i felt at once convinced that he was right it would make no difference it was not relief he wanted 
I seemed to perceive dimly that what he wanted, what he was, as it were, waiting for, was something not easy to define, something in the nature of an opportunity. I had given him many opportunities, but they had been merely opportunities to earn his bread. Yet what more could any man do? The position struck me as hopeless, and poor Briarly's saying recurred to me. Let him creep twenty feet underground and stay there. Better that, I thought, than this waiting above ground for the impossible. Yet one could not be sure even of that. There and then, before his boat was three oars' lengths away from the quay, I had made up my mind to go and consult Stein in the evening. This Stein was a wealthy and respected merchant. His house, because it was a house, Stein and Company, and there was some sort of partner who, as Stein said, looked after the Moluccas, had a large inter-island business with a lot of trading ports established in the most out-of-the-way places for collecting the produce. His wealth and respectability were not exactly the reasons why I was anxious to seek his advice. I desired to confide my difficulty to him because he was one of the most trustworthy men I had ever known. The gentle light of a simple, unwearied, as it were, and intelligent good nature illumined his long hairless face. It had deep downward folds, and was pale as of a man who had always led a sedentary life, which was indeed very far from being the case. His hair was thin and brushed back from a massive and lofty forehead. One fancied that at twenty he must have looked very much like what he was now at threescore. It was a student's face. Only the eyebrows, nearly all white, thick and bushy, together with the resolute, searching glance that came from under them, were not in accord with his, I may say, learned appearance. He was tall and loose-jointed. His slight stoop, together with an innocent smile, made him appear benevolently ready to lend you his ear. His long arms, with pale, big hands, had rare, deliberate gestures of a pointing-out, demonstrating kind. I speak of him at length, because under this exterior, and in conjunction with an upright and indulgent nature— this man possessed an intrepidity of spirit and a physical courage that could have been called reckless, had it not been like a natural function of the body, say, good digestion, for instance, completely unconscious of itself. It is sometimes said of a man that he carries his life in his hand. Such a saying would have been inadequate if applied to him. During the early part of his existence in the East, he had been playing ball with it, all this was in the past, but I knew the story of his life and the origin of his fortune. He was also a naturalist of some distinction, or perhaps I should say a learned collector. Entomology was his special study. His collection of buprestidae and longicorns, beetles all, horrible miniature monsters looking malevolent in death and immobility— and his cabinet of butterflies, beautiful and hovering under the glass of cases on lifeless wings, had spread his fame far over the earth. The name of this merchant, adventurer, and sometime adviser of a Malay sultan, to whom he never alluded otherwise than as my poor Mohammed Bonso, had, on account of a few bushels of dead insects, become known to learned persons in Europe, who could have no conception, and certainly would not have cared to know anything of his life or character. I, who knew, considered him an eminently suitable person to receive my confidences about Jim's difficulties, as well as my own. End of chapters 18 and 19